Oh, what um is your? I shouldn't say this on the air in front of everyone. Now that I realize about it, whatever. What's your security code? Yeah, because Mateus is gonna come in like forty five minutes. I think. Um, You're on the board. Gotcha. But I'll write it down for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just realizing that. <laughs> the code is B. So I'm not sure how to tell if we have other uh, people in the thing with us. Um, two, wait, here, I'll show you. That's right. Uh, three little shows. Oh, you don't know it. how many years ago? <laughs> they change it every so often. Um, Is that what you have? And he needs that. Oh, okay. Sign. No, that is not at all what I have. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Good. Cool. He might have to hold the pound sign because I think that's how it activates. All right, we're about to start. If anyone's out there in cyberspace, we have one viewer. So oh, we do have one viewer. It almost lets us. <laughs> it said zero earlier. So oh, okay. All right. We Although I guess person. we can't see the chat. <clears throat> one minute, right? Or is there a chat? I don't know. Yeah, I'll um, I'll try to pull it up on my phone to see because I would like to get questions if the. <laughs> oh. Never mind. Has any. Uh, we lost him. <laughs> we lost him. All right. Why don't we just get started? All right. One viewer again. All right. <laughs> Welcome back, viewer. So why don't we? Yeah, so that's what you're going to go through first. But... Oh. Hey, Mike. Um, I think we got it figured out. Could you just double check that it's working? Okay, so it's working. Now, do we see people's chat comments on the side? <laughs> okay. Um, so is there any way to see the comments? Is Okay, uh, I'll pull it up on my phone, I guess. All right. Okay. Okay, gotcha. All right, thanks. So All right. Um, well, why don't I start the meeting? And do you want to pull up the Liberty Me page on your? So this is public choice theory, and this is the Austrian Economics Society, which we are the rebranded New Hampshire Austrian Economics Group, um, in case you were following our previous hijinks. <laughs> and we have, uh, today's meeting will be on public choice theory. And uh, public choice theory, which is sometimes known as the Virginia School of Economics, um, and more specifically, James Buchanan's kind of, uh, who's sometimes no, synonymous with public choice theory, though he also kind of represents part of public choice theory, and there's a lot of other public choice theorists who don't necessarily hold the same views as James. But James Buchanan and the Virginia School of Economics and public choice theory, kind of for our purposes, are going to be one uh, for this conversation, yeah. one topic. For example, of some more public choice people, there's these guys. And the guy who co-wrote a book with Buchanan, Gordon Tullock. So just some examples. So what are we going to do first? Well, let's see. I have some uh, questions here I'll uh, ask rhetorically and then answer. And um, <laughs> uh, so. Buchanan's piece that was the reading for this week was the de-romanticization of politics. And so what is the opinion of Buchanan 
on the Austrian School of Economics is uh, one question, because Buchanan explicitly references uh, the Austrian School of Economics in this essay. And uh, his opinion is that he's very excited by the resurgence of Austrian economics. Um, he talks a lot about, well, he doesn't go to in great detail, but he says that's one of the promising avenues of hope. And he's very uh, critical of the newer, younger, more statistical uh, calculus-based economists, the mathematized economists. So he shares kind of that uh, phobia with the Austrian school. And uh, does he use any Austrian nomenclature? Uh, yes, he uses the word uh, vert frei to mean value free. Uh, he talks about methodological individualism a yeah. bit in here as well. Um, what else? Did he, he mentions Cadillacy. That's right, yeah. Which he talks about in this book as well. He is what should economists do, which is a collection of his essays. He, he says we shouldn't call it economics, but catalactics because economics means that there's a problem that we can figure out the answer to versus in a catalaxy it's you know yeah. people pursuing their ends and stuff there's no um, solution to the there's economy. no one you know you know the economists can't go around and solve you know what's what's the optimal x or you know whatever yeah um something else i guess that we can point out is buchanan has um talked with a lot of austrians in fact in his earlier work on price theory and costs he uses the subjective costs uh, whatever theory versus like the more objective costs of say some some of the English economists like Marshall and stuff like that. So he's very, I guess, inf very much influenced by Austrians throughout his life. He's been, although some you know I wouldn't call him an Austrian per se, but he does take some interest or influence. Yeah, from he's him. definitely part of the loose Austrian yeah. movement, kind of like you know White, Selgin, Coase, Ostrom, these people who kind of share Something. a lot of the method and methodology, but aren't necessarily historically thought of as Austrians. Yeah. Uh, so um, does he use any non-Austrian nomenclature? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, he's a little more mainstream in that he likes to use the term utility function, but as kind of Brian Kaplan points out, Austrians shouldn't necessarily be terrified of utility function. All it means is preferences, you know, when you really get down to, because economists, you know, define discontinuous utility functions in such an arbitrary way that you can make them say anything. And really, it, they're just talking about preferences, uh, people, utility slash preferences for certain political goods or economic goods. Uh, so I don't think he's necessarily non-Austrian when he talks about utility functions in this. I think he's using a word that Austrians are uncomfortable with. He also talks about um, homo economicus a bit, and he seems to be for it in oh. some cases. You know, I, didn't, I haven't read as much of his stuff as you have, so all I know is the essay that uh, we read for this, he uh, strictly says, I don't take a side on homo economicus, oh. whether people are altruistic or whether they're homo economicus and acting in their self-interest. Uh, he kind of says, obviously, people are some combination of the two, so I won't stake a claim for Homo economicus. Uh, oh, he makes he that. might have changed his mind in that. Interesting. Cool. Um, he also uses positivist as a synonym for Vert Fry, which isn't very Austrian, because uh, the Austrians kind of hate the positivist method, uh, which is um, kind of lumped in with value free. Uh, non-moral based science but shouldn't be necessarily hmm. although the question is is he using it in the same way or not no I think always... he's using it as a synonym for vert fry yeah, but I think that's just problematic confusing that people. the Austrians point out is like no positivism is a scientific methodology and method uh, vert fry means value free morally but it, vert fry can apply to non-positivist methodologies like mathematics or Austrian economics uh, uh, but, you know, um, he talks about legitimacy um, as maybe an objective thing, which I thought was a little problematic. Um, and he seems to be kind of hesitant to fully embrace the full implications of spontaneous order. He says, orderly trade in private goods and services can take place only within a defined legal structure that establishes individuals' rights of ownership and control of resources, that enforces private contracts, and that places limits on exercise of government powers, pretty much saying the market can, by definition, only exist within the context of a constitutional state, which 
I think just from an evidence perspective is pretty problematic, right? Pr markets for cigarettes in prison, <laughs> like, you know, markets are everywhere. They don't yeah. really care about the constitution, I think, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess it's not so much of an Austrian point though. Yeah, because well, he's a lot of his work is on constitutions, so yeah. that's probably why. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah, because <laughs> I, I think we want to wrap this up in an hour, so I want to spend yeah. you know at least like maybe going over twenty something. minutes talking about Friedman. <laughs> I think we'll spend the we rest can of probably time. do five on Friedman because right. it's TLDR for most people. Um, okay, so this is question two. We were just talking uh, about yes. what is Buchanan's opinion of Homo economicus. And I made up this word of politico altruisticus. Okay. <laughs> I, it sounds like pre human. Is. But anyway, so there's this one idea that people follow their own incentives, and then there's another idea that our public servants are kind of great and moral people, and we should be, you know, astonished and outraged if they ever follow their incentives, <laughs> and we shouldn't be expecting that of them. Um, and obviously, the ideas are completely opposed. And people are some mix of the two, I think everyone will really admit, you know, everyone's a little bit selfish and a little bit altruistic. And so um, it kind of depends uh, on nuances and homo economicus as a concept is pretty silly, which is that everyone's completely selfish all the time. Um, Calculating, you know, rational as in the non-Austrian definition of rational, meaning that, yeah. you know, perfect knowledge kind of stuff. So. Now people always, I think, seek to maximize their utility uh their value they always will choose the option they value highest kind of by definition yada 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 from austrian economic economics so you know some people talk about homo economicus as simply someone who's maximizing their utility and i don't think that's as problematic but really when people talk about homo economicus yeah, in the classic sense these assumptions yeah they're talking about maximizing your monetary um you know income that's really what economists use in their models for homo economicus yeah. and humans don't always choose to maximize their monetary income so it's a problematic uh yeah models absent of uncertainty as well yeah in a lot of these cases Moving on. all right uh can voting or constitutional rights constrain the government according to buchanan no <laughs> and he's very like uh, almost anarchist here. In fact, I think he self calls he himself it. a political anarchist. Yeah. But he says that um, voting, if voting and constitutional rights could constrain the government, you wouldn't have had any totalitarianism in Russia and China because both of those places have constitutions and elections. But it didn't do much good. Um, pretty much, most people agree that communism is going to lead to tyranny. At this point, it has everywhere it's been tried. Um, you know, most leftists and Marxists now are like, oh, well, we don't want Stalinism. You know, when you have one person in charge of everything, it doesn't matter who, what the votes or the ballots or the Constitution says. It's whoever controls the economy kind of controls the show. So that's Buchanan's opinion of uh, constitutional rights and voting is they're kind of worthless uh, by themselves. All right. Uh, Buchanan talks about the economics of the minimal night watchman state in his description of constitutional government. Um, would all constitutions need to provide such a state if they were to succeed, according to Buchanan? And he's kind of leaning towards, yes, uh, you can't have a central planned economy with a constitution. It's not the constitution isn't going to meet anything if the state was to succeed at following the constitution and for the constitution to actually constrain the government, according to Buchanan, you would need a minimal night watchman state. What might a possible critique of Buchanan be? Well, uh, we need a unicorn for there to be liberty. You know, maybe <laughs> these things don't exist, minimal night watchman states. And that's certainly Rothbard's point that uh, it's easier to find examples of stateless societies than it is to find examples of minimum, minimal watchman states and Rothbard would argue that there really haven't ever been any anywhere. And they all trend towards larger and larger government over time. That's kind of the Higgs, uh, Robert Higgs's footnote to Rothbard, where you have the ratchet effect, where usually there's a war, depression, GDP, government share GDP goes up. Then it goes down a little in peacetime, but not down to its original level. Then it goes up for the next war, depression. And over time, you have this kind of ratcheting effect of increasing the government intervention, even if you start with a fairly laissez-faire state. 
And then Rothbard kind of agreed with Marx that laissez-faire minimal states are typically the most destructive to the liberty of foreigners because they become the empires. Uh, and this is kind of intuitive that, uh, you know, Venezuela can barely pay its policemen. It can't invade Iraq. Uh, it takes a wealthy capitalist country to mount a successful foreign invasion. Uh, the empires are almost all very laissez-faire, uh, England, Rome, uh, the U.S., compared to the other states at the time, at least. <laughs> All right, uh, so what two economists hold the view that committees and democracies can't be rational? Um, and these are kind of the predecessors of public choice theory. Some people call them public choice theorists, although I think um, Buchanan says they're not really public yes. choice theorists, they're more moral philosophers. Oh, uh, Arrow, he's just a general equilibrium economist like if you, this was like a side paper I think. yeah so yeah. like and black i've just never heard of before so yeah apparently he was influential uh so arrow <laughs> will take Buchanan's can't word <laughs> at least he was <laughs> like the 1960s or whatever. um arrows paradox is something that you might hear in a philosophy or economics class and it pretty much says democracies can't be internally consistent and support the values of its members um and Arrow was, I guess, influenced by uh, Wixell, is what I learned in the Boston Austrian Economics Group when that guy came in. Top. Makes sense. Arrow's general equilibrium theorist who got a lot of influence from Marshall and, you know, the like right before the turn of the 20th century economist. So Wixell would, seems right. Um, and then Black says that in certain circumstances, majority, so majority cycles are why Black says committees and democracies are inherently kind of broken and irrational. And he says majority cycles won't exist and committees can be rational and adopt the policies of the median voter, but only on simple one dimensional issues when there's no political right. representatives, yada, yada, yada. So in kind of certain narrow circumstances, democracy can work according to black, but for the rest of the time, you're gonna encounter majority cycles. I think the example given was the school board with the one yeah. who wanted the higher finance and low in the median, and of course the median one, because there's only three of them. So. And black also kind of takes that the median voter winning is a good thing, but what the hell's so special about <laughs> the median voter? You know, <laughs> I never got that. <laughs> it's just that. Uh, so what is Buchanan's criticism of Black and Arrow? Uh, he says they both have theories of political demand, but not political supply. So they're talking about the voters, but it's almost as if a robot is implementing these policies that the voters have, which is actually almost a very, you know, anarchist argument that they're making, though, which is that even if politicians were perfect, the system would democracy would still be broken. That's really the argument that Black and Arrow are making. Uh, so, you know, public choice theory starts off with a theory of political demand that's very uh, kind of anarchistic. And then the supply side is kind of Buchanan's uh, specialty on the incentives of politicians and bureaucrats. So what problems arise with representative government, uh, senates, boards elected by shareholders, you know, maybe if you want to count that as a government, uh, that don't arise with consensus or direct democracy majoritarian government, like town hall where everyone mm -hmm. votes and there's no representatives, everyone votes directly on the budget lines. Uh, and representatives don't necessarily represent the interests of the voters who elected them is the problem that Buchanan points out. And, you know, for the Liberty Me audience, probably this also <laughs> sounds kind of intuitive, but he's very kind of yeah. a cutting edge in anarchy for an economist in the 1960s. That's our chat. So oh. we have people in. Um, all right. So what is the primary difference between democracy and the market for Buchanan? Democracy means all or none, whereas the market occurs at the margins, is Buchanan's take on that. So the median voter wins in democracy, whereas the marginalized voter is more likely to win in the market. Uh, and so, you know, there's choice in the market, I think is how libertarians typically put it and there's much less choice with the state <laughs> yeah. 
I think Buchanan refers to it as the monopoly supplier of uh, yeah during the portion of this paper. Um, so Buchanan thinks that due to the fact government has gotten out of hand, uh, politicians and bureaucracy should be modeled more as a monopoly than as a competing unit. Uh, why might this be a problematic analysis? Well, first of all, gotten out of hand is a little bit subjective. You know, he's making an argument uh, that kind of is, oh, the world's getting worse and worse and worse, and we used to have much more freedom, and we used the government used to follow the Constitution, and kind of, you know, what, what you hear on Fox News all the time. <laughs> but I don't know if this is actually true. I mean, you know, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed uh, like five years after the Constitution was, and they outlawed all criticism of the president. So... I, th I think these golden age arguments, uh, it's kind of tough to find real uh, kind of objective standards here. You know, there's definitely a ro um, Robert Higgs's ratchet effect seems to be true. He's found some statistical evidence for it, but that uh, specifically has to do with government share of GDP as a uh, proportion of the economy, not necessarily whether the government's following the constitution yeah, or is not even going to measure anything. that because that's subjective to begin with. Yeah. Seeing as there's multiple ways to interpret this document we're talking about. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, according to like every constitutional law professor, yeah, the government is following get, the constitution. Yeah. So. And they'll give you 50 different reasons why yeah. on the same topic. So it's, it's there's no like objective measure. All right. Um, oh, and then what the other point I was going to make is even in highly repressive, undemocratic regimes, there's still typically some degree of competition, though. It's never kind of perfectly monopolistic or totalitarian government. They're still going to like face laugher curve restraints where if they uh, raise taxes beyond a certain point, revenue is actually going to go down. And um just because people can choose, you know, to engage in history and stuff. And, you know, smaller governments always face competition in the form of people leaving. And even when there's Im emigration barriers, people always um, can, you know, duck it's under like, walls and get under borders and things like yeah. that. But it's like with any monopoly, even in market situations, there's always a substitute good to be yeah. found. It's not a perfect substitute, but there's always a substitute. So government's kind of not necessarily a perfect monopoly, yeah. and it's certainly not perfectly competitive, yeah, but there's, there's elements no of competition. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so this is the last question on our first um, kind of essay. What killed socialism and de-romanticized politics for Buchanan and the other economists? And it was pretty much just evidence um, <laughs> that public choice theory then kind of became modeled on evidence and uh, public choice theory really took off after communism became evident as such a spectacular failure because obviously constitutions and bills of rights, you know, if they could guarantee freedom, they would have because all the communist countries had constitutions and bills of rights and most of them had elections, you know. China still has elections. Uh, they had them back in the 1960s during the top, you know, Maoist uh, <laughs> regime. Uh, and Mises and the Austrians were kind of the only people who didn't need the evidence, I think. Um, they kind of, yeah, they had their, you know, pure theory that showed very right. well that uh, socialism was impossible uh, slash inefficient. And you're always going to have huge black markets. You can't ever abolish the black market. And um, so socialism is impossible in that sense. And then also it's uh, inefficient and going to not uh, give people what they want and lead to a very impoverished existence as compared to capitalist neighbors with similar technologies. So um, have we gotten any questions from the audience? Uh, let's take a look. Oops, it's not out. Just closed it out for me. Ooh. Well, we'll take questions. I guess. Yeah, and unfortunately, the comments don't come up here. So it should load here. Added a lot more to the combo. Yeah, I don't see uh, nothing really. No questions. All right, yeah, I don't think that's about us. <laughs> so, no questions, but we've got four viewers still. All right. Impressively. Well, I think before we go on, <laughs> we should, because uh, Buchanan mentions some words that we didn't go over yet that might be yeah. worth defining. So he talks about log rolling a little bit. 
in this essay, and I think we should talk about what that is for people who might not know. So it's like vote trading, basically, to, you know, so let's say there's like a, I don't know, I don't know, Congress or something, and you really want something to get passed, but how are you going to do that? So you might say, okay, colleague, senator, whatever, I'll vote on your bill if you vote on my bill. So that's like an example of log rolling, if you will, a simple example. <laughs> and then um, isn't log rolling is, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, it's one of the um, kind of ways in which corruption is legal, right? Where yeah. people say, oh, you know, politicians are corrupt. And it's like, well, you know, you can't ever stamp money out of politics. You can't ever stamp corruption out of politics. It's just essential to the being of politics. And so people say, let's get money out of politics. It's like, okay, let's get the water out of the Indian Ocean. You know, good <laughs> luck with that. Uh, just because even when, you know, direct monetary bribes and all campaign financing is federally funded and equal and everything like that, you still have log rolling. Um, you still have uh, vote trading for unions where, you know, if the union comes out and votes for you because you give money directly to the union, uh, that's still right. corruption. It's just, you, know, you can still have rent seeking it. without money being, you know, there's yeah. other political favors that can be done. You know, you don't have to receive bribes as in, you know, in monetary form or anything like that. So, or even Getting kind of money um, out of politics, the voters themselves, for instance, in the suburbs, Groups. they all vote to outlaw apartment buildings in like every suburb in America because they want to <laughs> keep property values high which, you know, is price fixing, right? <laughs> when you want to keep the price of something constant or increasing. And so uh, pretty much every suburb in America has banned apartment buildings uh, because all the voters share the same corruption, right? They right. want to keep their property values high. So it's corrupt politics, but like there's no way to get that out of politics. There's people are going to vote in their own self-interest. Um, right. Well, sometimes. Just members <laughs> of a bureaucracy too will vote for certain yeah. things too. Like the post office, people yeah. who work for the post office will vote for, you know, Oh, let's, this guy wants to bail out the post office. Let's vote for this guy, you know? And then the bureaucracy has its own uh, power apart from the ballot box, yes, too, because they can do right. all sorts of things. Like, um, well, I mean, in the Soviet countries, they can target politicians that they don't like. And in the U.S., probably, too, the NSA workers uh, have all sorts of dirt on politicians. Yeah. Uh, they probably are actively involved in rigging elections right now, but I don't, I don't know, maybe they're but they could be if they the wanted to, and kind of they're stupid if they're not because they have the ability. <laughs> but um, yeah, the bureaucracy can do like Washington Monument Syndrome too, where they uh, uh, close down the Washington Monument and everyone gets all pissed off and goes, oh, we need to give more money to the yeah. Parks Department. When the Parks Department had plenty <laughs> enough money to run the Washington yeah. Monument, they're just using it as a uh, tool for media. media or whatever. Or whatever. Anyway. I think that's it for this essay. Well, I guess it should also be, an, it's interesting to note that he takes some sort of Hayekian view of the common good as there is no common good. It's just no. cattle, actually, basically. So that was interesting, too, to add. But besides that, I think did a good job summing that up. Right. It's next to Becky and Leeson. Uh, do you want to do that or Friedman? Uh, I guess we can do Friedman in a very short way. All right, we'll spend a little <laughs> bit of time on Friedman yeah. and then do more on yeah. Becky and Leeson. So Friedman, and we're not talking about Milton or any other Friedman. We're talking about <laughs> Jeffrey Friedman. Is he? He's not related. Is I he? don't think he I is. Think so, yeah. We're not talking about Patry or. Uh, let's, I forget the other one. But yeah, so uh, there. So he has an essay called Popper, Weber, and Hayek: The the epistemology the, epistemology of politics of ignorance. So it's sort of like a very long essay, and um, it's sort of has a meta critique of a lot of stuff, not really solely on public choice, but he mentions it quite a bit in this essay and a lot of stuff critiquing public choice over the years. And um, he has his own journal that a lot of Austrians publish in. So that's another interesting thing. So um, his main critique against the public choice thing is the sort of practitioners of it who follow the home economics throughout where they'll say, okay, they're selfish in, in a rational way. They're going to, you know, these politicians are obviously calculating people who can figure out, you know, okay, this vote trade will do this versus this, blah, blah, blah. They can figure out the And also sort of assuming thing. that the voters are rational yeah, too is part of public big, choice theory where the voters, yeah. you know, are not necessarily yeah. rational. I think everyone yeah. will admit. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing he points out here where he goes on to say political ignorance is not usually rational. That's yeah. like his quote. And um, 
he has a long long portion of it is called rational versus radical ignorance for the voters where I guess we should go over what rational ignorance is in terms of the voter. So I guess that goes to say it's too costly to keep track of, you know, everything that goes on in the political world and it's so costly to, you know, be fully informed. Therefore, people will just not vote because they also realize that their one vote will not determine the course of the election and therefore it's just the opportunity cost of voting or not worth it. So, um, and Friedman critiques that portion of um, public choice. And there's a quote. So he goes on to say, um, so there, you know, oh, why are people spending so much time basically, you know, trying to engage in politics if they know, you know, they have no, nothing they can do, you know, change it, their vote will not matter. And he says, however, millions of people do vote and a great many of them make onerous efforts to become well uh, informed enough to justify voting one way rather than another. And then he goes on to say, millions of people care deeply about politics, devoting and sometimes sacrificing their lives to it. In many cases, uh, rioting, you know, demonstrating, organizing, and even committing acts of terror for politics. So, I mean, this doesn't strike me as people who realize, you know, that it's, why am I doing this? It's too costly. I mean, they wouldn't be doing this yeah, in, well, a, in a praxeological sense. The libertarian movement, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, why are we here? Why are we doing Plenty this? of us could be making more money doing <laughs> yeah, other <seriously>. things. <laughs> could have been reading a book on yeah. coding or something. Why am I doing this? <laughs> um, the, which I think, you know, to stand up for Buchanan, and I haven't read everything he's written, but in yeah, the, I think. In, no, go ahead, sir. Well, I was going to say, in the deromanticization of politics, Buchanan doesn't necessarily take a because people, you know, I'm not going to say whether they're more selfish, homo economicus, right. or more altruistic. Uh, I'll leave that to the psychologists and philosophers. I'm just going to say they, you know, will follow their utility, whether that's an altruistic utility or a uh, selfish utility, which I think is something the Austrians can kind of side with, with people will follow their preferences and their preferences will be, uh, can be selfish or altruistic. And sometimes the definition of these two words is hazy. So uh, that's, kind of my standing up for Buchanan against Friedman's attack. Yeah. <laughs> I would say this is more so just a critique of public choice as a field yeah. versus more so Buchanan's version of public choice. And he might be, I think, more on the Austrian side of public yeah. choice, and there's a lot more mathematical and homo economicus based public choice that's probably uh, more popular with the journals. <laughs> yeah, and just political science fields in general. Um, it's another good quote here that I wrote down. Um, so he talks about political ignorance and he writes, political ignorance is a problem of human finitude. This is ignorance, a kind of radical as opposed to rational that opens up the possibility that what we know is not only an incomplete picture of reality, but a blinkered one. So, I mean, we have, we don't have full information. It's not like we just, we have full information that we could talk about these things. So that's important to point out to like the other public choice theories that we were just talking about. So. They're sort of modeling it as the homo economics yeah. of politics, which uh, Friedman takes issue with. And I think that sums up most of his critiques on public choice in this paper, because it's 50 pages and probably 10 of them deal directly with public choice. The rest is just meta stuff that doesn't involve anything related to this. Yeah, we're just critiques gluten, on gluten is for stuff. punishment. Yes. That's why we, <laughs> this is one of the recommended <laughs> readings. <laughs> but, um, well, so what do you think? Do you think uh, people are somewhat, you know, 50% rational? I know we're kind of like dealing with useless <laughs> Are you trying to quantify right? yeah, things yeah. here? No, really. When, <laughs> when like people go to the polls, how much of it is altruism and how much of it is rationality? And obviously we can't quantify it. But like I think when it comes to local politics, it is very selfish and rational when it comes to like building codes and uh, homeowners voting right. on their local zoning ordinances and the local city selectmen. Homeowners have a very strong incentive to keep their property values high. Right. And I think they generally vote home. this way. Yeah. Uh, Some of them, it's like, we're not really going to care too much about what goes on there. Like, um, and I think uh, probably Hayek's argument, which Friedman talks about, would apply very much to federal issues where there's just um, no one really knows what policy would be best for them. 
right. uh, from the experts down to the idiots. You know, no one right. really knows how different changes in federal government policy will shake out. You know, and I don't think necessarily libertarians or ANCAPs have a special uh, thrown to stand on because you know you make these arguments of let's lower taxes next year it's like well what if that you know um, causes a military coup because all these unemployed yeah. soldiers are off like no one knows exactly how yeah. the future is going to shake out yeah. <laughs> once you leave the set par world it's unpredictable you really don't know what's going to happen and I guess to go back to your point some amusing uh, uh, whatever factoids from this paper he goes on to explain you know cases of where you know, voter ignorance is manifested. And he goes on, I think there was a point where he says about during the, what is it, 90 or 80, whatever, 88 election or whatever with uh, Bush Sr., uh, more people knew that he hated broccoli and didn't know his stance on the death penalty, which is obviously like what people care about in electoral politics. <laughs> um, what was the other one? Um, apparently, I think it was some presidential candidate in the 70s was trying to eat a tamale, but he didn't know how to... <laughs> shuck the the shell or, yeah. or corn whatever and like um that made him lose the election or whatever like this is what people care about in yeah. politics it's not really things that will probably matter because you know it's like a reality tv show yeah. where uh, do people care about this contestant winning versus this contestant because they're altruistic <laughs> or selfish it's like no it doesn't really have anything to do with altruism or selfishness it's just kind of like a game <laughs> like you know yeah. it's a gladiator match or a reality tv show and you know i love that donald trump is like leading the polls That's it just great. shows that the whole That's thing great. is a joke you know in a reality tv show <laughs> He's done. He's done a great job for uh, baseball cap sales too, I believe. Oh yeah, make America great again. <laughs> cap sellers nationwide, love it. All right. Uh, well, should we spend a couple minutes on uh, Bet Key and then maybe do a little memorial for Andrew, and then we'll yeah. talk about some other stuff on uh, Liberty Me. That sounds good. So uh, the Bet Key one, what was it called? An Austrian perspective on public choice. Or yeah. Something like that. That was a short read too. It wasn't too much. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, they sort of compare uh, the Austrian school and the Virginia school, which I think we mentioned earlier, the Virginia school is what sort of became a school after Buchanan worked at like George Mason, uh, uh, another school in Virginia, and uh, just Virginia State. He worked at a couple of schools, so these people followed him around. And would you call the Virginia School of Economics a school of public choice theory, or is it more complicated than that, do you think? Uh, I guess you could say the originators of public choice came out of the Virginia School, but okay. public choice has expanded beyond the Virginia School. Yeah, and the Virginia yeah. School is apparently like dead because I had the last remaining <laughs> publishing yeah. Virginia School economist, the Boston Austrian Economics Group, and he's stopped doing Virginia School economics. <laughs> he's now doing kind of more Chicago economics uh, just because it's the only thing that pays money, and they'll <laughs> admit it. Like. There you go. Yeah, I think they were their heyday was like in the 60s and 70s, right around when Calculus of Consent came out, which was uh, Buchanan's uh, earlier book that was written with the Gordon Tullock. So Tullock was another one. I think he's alive, but I don't think he does public choice much. Yeah. He teaches at George Mason, but I don't think he does public choice. I might be wrong. I don't know. But um, what else is there on this essay? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, Becky points out, Pecky and Lisa, and they point out something we've mentioned that um, sort of the uh, divide, if you will, between the public choice things, strengths versus the weaknesses from an Austrian standpoint. And they talk about an Austrian public choice hybrid where we incorporate things such as uncertainty into the mix. You know, we talk about just not having full knowledge and stuff like that and um, trying to get, kick out the homo econom economicus, uh, you know, variants of public choice it might be a way of you know pushing public choice closer to the austrian school which of thought. is kind of like bet key's project for almost <laughs> yeah, every school of economics to kind of like absorb everything like, into like the, the essay austrian the institutional yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of that's amalgamate and take over all of economics which i love and it's, i think he might actually be shot. successful at because george mason's really pulling its weight intellectually top, in the top 50 uh, economics programs i believe i think now. it's like 30 or something oh, really? and they and they're number 10 shout for, out to uh, yeah <laughs> shout, if you're one of the four viewers <laughs> Becky, uh, props <laughs> uh yeah and i think they're the 10th most downloaded from the ssr oh, insight really? which kind of shows you what it economists are actually reading and so economists will <laughs> be reading yeah. a lot of the stuff that comes out of gmu yeah like uh they have a quote here 
Um, hence, by ignoring the structural uncertainty of the future and the diffusions and subjectivity of knowledge, public choice analysis, one could argue, is methodologically inconsistent with Austrian economics. So those are like the elements they see that's wrong with public choice. So, and that can be easily fixed by just loosening the assumptions of what is, you know, used in these public choice models. So I think there is a way to be conceive of a workable public choice Austrian, you know, framework thing. Yeah, and you know, uh, Buchanan certainly, uh, you know, he said the most exciting thing for the future of public choice is that a lot of people are getting interested in Mises and Hayek again, right. and this was back in like the 70s. So I don't know. Maybe he he would be really turned off with like the Rothbard movement. <laughs> There's a chance, but uh... <laughs> I think they did cross paths, and I think they did not like each other. Uh, that doesn't surprise. I think me. Rothbard really hated Buchanan <laughs> for his constitutional work. For oh, I guess you can yeah. figure out why. Well, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, and they do bring up um, Mises's bureaucracy as an early um, Austrian sort of foray into public choice. So something to worth maybe looking into later on. Yeah, and he, you know, Mises really goes into the nitty gritty of what, why bureaucracy is um, kind of fought by the profit mechanism and how without the profit mechanism, a uh, bureaucracy is kind of like a cancer that just keeps on growing and prof the profit mechanism is the radiation or whatever that kills the cancer. Uh, or the colloidal silver, if you're not. But so pretty much this is why nonprofits tend to be so bureaucratic, which is so kind of like Mises public choice theory extends way beyond government. It also right. goes into why, for instance, overheads tend to be so much higher on charities than they are on for profit businesses. And why, in fact, now you're seeing for profit charities as a model that is being <laughs> successful. Right. You're reading Rainbow is a successful for-profit charity, and it kind of sounds counterintuitive, but uh, Mises goes into this reason why, where if you don't have profit as kind of the guiding mission of your organization, you're going to have several different guiding missions. Like kind of, I work at a college nonprofit, and so we have you know like <laughs> diversity, the environment, healthcare, just like all these yeah. things, and they assign metrics to all of them that are kind of arbitrary numbers. Right. And you, you have to use up your budget by the end of the quarter. Well, yeah. So, that, so this yeah. is what ends up happening is when you have all these arbitrary metrics besides profit, you just get uh, bureaucracy expanding right. where you have, uh, yeah, you got to use all your budget before the end of the use year. Use it or lose it kind of thing. And yeah, if you that's... spend extra, you get extra because they know you need it. If you yeah. spend less, they know you don't need yeah. the money, so you won't get as much. <laughs> And um, then Washington Monument Center is, oh, they're thinking of cutting the budget. Well, what's the thing they like the most? We're going to cut that yeah. first, you know, make them real. Kids like ice cream, <laughs> get rid of the ice cream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this was another good quote from that. Um, so that sort of divide between the Austrians and like the Buchanan sort of thing from as Betke and Leeson write, Mises challenged the omniscient assumption while Buchanan challenges the benevolence assumption, which I think is a fair point to make. Yeah. So, and if so, you could somehow get those two together, I think you'd have a lot of good stuff to research, basically. So. Um, well, let's see. So uh, I think we've covered it all. Do you want to talk a little about our friend Andrew Silva, oh, who yes. recently um, recently passed away? I think technically he's still on life support, but he is brain dead. So we're going to be pulling pulling the plug. And Andrew had a heart attack. He was a brilliant Austrian economist. And um, if anyone knows Andrew, he was always very opinionated. Uh, Andrew Silva, a very big, witty, jovial guy, guy witty. Uh, he knew a lot of the greats. He was friends with Bettina and uh, Percy Graves. Uh, he met everyone. He yeah, really like, met everyone. He knew Lachman. He knew Kersner well. Uh, who else did he know? Boss. Basically, oh, every Sanderson. Austrian that was alive before the internet. So yeah, and he knew a lot of like, <laughs> like mainstream 60s to like internet days. You know, present he probably know them. So and he was very uh, you know just a keen rational mind. Where you know yeah. we, we went through and read Man, Economy, and State uh, for the New Hampshire Austrian Economics Group, and he just kind of seized on every little kind of like. <laughs> where Rothbard kind of jumps a step or where he makes something into a graph that really shouldn't be a graph. And yeah. Rothbard even admits that, you know, Andrew was kind of right on that. You know, he didn't let Rothbard yeah. get away with anything. Yeah, he and, cornered uh, Tucker on, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, listing all the, uh, whatever scale, <laughs> the value scale. The value scale. How could yeah. you know this and this and this? Like no one does that or something. And yeah. Tucker was like, yeah. 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 
We're, uh, so if anyone on fish trading like 75 fish for one horse, uh, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, Andrew Silva cleverly brought up that no one has this value scale in their heads. You know, no one knows really what they would trade things for before the trade occurs. That really there's only two choices. There's the choice you made and there's every other option which you decided not to go with. And you don't even really know yourself until the choice is being made. And so... Yeah. Um, you know, there's definitely preferences in this sense, but you can't necessarily write out a table of, oh, I prefer 133 fish at the margins to one and a half horses, right. but I wouldn't get as much. It's like, no one actually thinks like this. And, um, but you know, he's an Austrian economist and I think he was yeah. more of an Austrian than a lot of Austrians in that he didn't uh, let anyone slip past the methodology. Yeah. Everything had to be absolutely which is yeah. always good in the Austrian circles, which doesn't happen often. So Yeah. Um, it may be worth tracking. He did have some writing that should be noted as well. He did translate some of Mises' work that was only available in Spanish, yeah. which we should try and find. And he also found that other article that was not in the English language before, that Czech lady. Yeah. So this is stuff that's like not even like on any Mises Institute stuff. And I'll have to get in contact with his family because I wonder if he has papers. He probably does. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go like right no, through yeah, his yeah, private yeah. stuff. <laughs> but uh, if he has papers that are kind of clearly academic, yeah, I would like be interested were... to see if we could get our hands on. Yeah, them. he did have a website which I don't recall the link to or the. Uh, I'll post it in the show. If you have it, yeah. So he wrote a bunch of essays, and on... some of it was related to public choice. Although yeah. he was not, he wouldn't call himself a public choice theorist. Right. No, we I don't did, think so. We did bring it up, and he did not like that term at all. <laughs> yeah. So he was, if anything, he just liked to be called an economist, I believe. He wouldn't even go by Austrian, I think. Yeah, although I think okay. he called himself an Austrian I guess economist. he pushed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, here's uh, here's the you, Andrew. Uh, you were an atheist, so I won't say you're up in heaven or anything. <laughs> and... Um, do we have any no, any com I wonder if we have any comments from other other people who we might as well do a quick check just to see if anyone just made like a heartfelt comment about Andrew though yeah I doubt it. <laughs> uh, we do have a guest. Oh, uh, is Mithun? Is Mithun there? Yes. Add a lot to the comment. Uh, I think that's old stuff. Uh, yeah. Nothing. Well, no questions. Any questions or anything? We've got four viewers. Well, I think um, we can go into we can a little bit. Plugging. Yeah, why don't we um, coming up talk about minutes. economics for a minute? Let's not have dead uh, air. I'm going to find something on my phone. So let's see, economic-wise, or economics-wise, what's been in the news lately? I don't really know. I've really been following too much. No, you know, I'm the only but, one uh, to be on the phone. Come on, come uh, on. You can freelance this. <laughs> oh. This is terrible well, radio. Both hosts can't more. be on their cell phones. So. <laughs> All right. So public choice related stuff wise. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that might be worth mentioning. Um, definitely go go and find um, Buchanan's What Should Economists Do book. It goes through some of his public choice work and some of his other work that's not strictly on public choice. Um, he has a couple of good essays on, um, you know, using catalaxy instead of economics and why that's important and some of the implications of that. Uh, his other book um, on costs, I believe is the name, or, uh, is also a good pickup. You can find it because it goes into subjective costs. Um, don't really know what else to talk about, public choice-wise, at least. Maybe I'll just talk a little uh, bit about, um, you know, examining the political system with economics and how there's not actually a lot of that that gets done uh -huh. because for whatever reason economists have almost exclusively chosen to focus on the market which uh, isn't the state kind of by definition mm -hmm. and so i think they um a lot of them kind of miss out on economics in the state sphere and so public choice theory and then i think austrian economics tackle this but um you know it seems like if economists paid as much attention to uh, voter and bureaucrat and politician, you know, and soldier and general incentives as they, you know, at least one tenth as much as attention 
to those incentives as they did to the incentives of business people, maybe we wouldn't be having all these horrible political yeah. problems because economists would be a little more uh, realistic about what the state can do. Because right. right now what they do is they look at the market and they say, okay, so there's this problem we've uh, figured out with the market. There's a market failure, so we'll there's just have the state fix it. Yeah, the nirvana fallacy, if there yeah. ever was one. Um, it's completely... I actually had an uh, economics professor in college who actually pointed that out. We were supposed to have a lesson on market failure, but we just read uh, Buchanan's essay. Oh, that, yeah. The one on uh, politics without romance. So that was my first introduction to Buchanan. So oh, that's great. Crazy. He was like, okay, yeah. I'm going to give you a lesson on market fa You know, screw it. We're reading Buchanan. That was pretty much it. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was good. He did have Hazlitt on the syllabus too, which was interesting. Nice. But he didn't know anything about Mises, which was even more interesting. Huh. Well, Hazlitt was famous <laughs> by his own right. He was yeah. more famous than Mises. Yeah, I mean, probably. he was the New York Times editorial writer for like, uh, you know, a decade. Yeah, and then Newsweek as well. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, though, from no mention of Mises at all. Although he, I think he's heard of him in passing, but never no. knew anything about who he was or, you know, what happened because of him. So. I forgot his name, but if he's listening, you should look out for Mises. So, yeah, well, it's the same with um, my macro professor. Loved Hayek and did a whole class on Hayek. Mm -hmm. But I asked him about Austrian business cycle theory and Hayek's business cycle theory, and he right. had ne he didn't even know that Hayek and the Austrians had their own business cycle theory. Yeah. He had never heard of the boom bust Austrian theory. He had just heard on uh, Hayek's, you know, the paper that won him the Nobel Prize. Uh. Uh, which was on um, information channels knowledge. and the use of knowledge. And uh, and he does kind of briefly mention uh, national income accounting and why government printing money isn't an answer to the depressions. But yeah, he didn't go into Austrian business cycle theory. So yeah, I don't know. if Because instead of economists studying politics, we have soci the sociology department, which doesn't care about economics. They don't care about incentives. They don't care about... And, um, they just care about, you know, like doing the right thing, you know, that's have equality and all this stuff, but they don't care really about how it gets done in terms of people's incentives. And the economists are looking at the market, which the sociology department thinks is evil and shouldn't exist. So <laughs> there's, there's an interesting segue into the, um, Friedman paper on that. He talks about that and he calls the, um, like sociology department and political science department as sort of like the historicists of the whole Oh, yeah. sphere because there's no really no real theory behind you know what they think is happening but if you throw in some public choice you might get a little bit more theory into you know why why did this happen you know yeah. versus oh we we did this test and you know we found this to happen but we don't know why any of this happens so you know like mises titled his work socialism an economic and sociological critique so it's like i almost feel like if we had never gotten the field of sociology if we just called it you know socioeconomics had one department hmm. you know maybe go with the webers or yeah. maybe economics would be completely horrible and marxist <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know actually if that would be a good idea Pry. maybe Pry it is campaign. a good thing we've kept economics in a little <laughs> bit of a bubble <laughs> um well let's see why don't i uh, go ahead and promote some other cool uh events happening on liberty me this week so uh coming up at uh, what is it? It's the Tuesday. Uh, coming up in eight minutes is Free Association, America, and the topic is America's non-representative war government. Oh. I think we're back. All right. The Technical failure. Cut out there for a second. So, yeah, that seems like a show that could use some public choice. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll do the promo for it uh, in my radio voice. If we really live under a representative government, how can a president take the country to war without <laughs> even a show vote in Congress, much less a referendum? Libertarian legends, Sheldon Richmond and Lucy Stigerwald show you who the U.S. government really represents. 
Uh, and then at uh, 9 p.m. today, we have Corey uh, Massimi, Massimino and Roderick Long uh, doing SFL Live. Oh. And um, SFL's really uh, like gotten um, very into like left anarchism recently, which I I love. Some people kind of like hate that, but the fact that Students for Liberty, which I've always thought is kind of like a whitewashed coke <laughs> organization, now has like the major left anarchists on. I, I, I don't know. know. I like it, <laughs> but I yeah. haven't been to one since that Boston one. So and even though was this, I didn't go to the series. I heard it was kind of small, but uh, not. Too. I'd rather not. <laughs> But he That's will have another story. Um, Roderick Long on, Corey and Roderick, both uh, anarchists, and um, they will talk about science fiction, moral philosophy, and left libertarianism. Uh. And then uh, tomorrow, there is Unbiased America with Mary Ruwert, who is the author of Healing Our World, which is a great book that I've read on healthcare and the state in general. And then at 10, there is We the Individuals, and Walter Block will be guesting into that. He will um, be the special guest. And they're going to talk about uh, Austrian economics, and it's uh, Jeff Scott uh, Peterson. Ah, uh, yep. yes. And, uh, he... Our fellow mod, the uh, <laughs> Discussions on Economics page, which I'll plug, because that's probably worth a plug since he's on here. Although I think it's a secret group, so you can't even see it if you search for it. Oh, really? Well, find me on Facebook, and I'll add you to it. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Austrian Economics Society... Uh, I think I'm going to retitle the Facebook New Hampshire Austrian Economics That's, Group, yeah, the Austrian yeah. Economics Society. And then I want to start doing uh, the Boston group on Liberty Me as well. And maybe not every Boston group meeting. Or something. Yeah. Uh, we also, so Mike and I are in New Hampshire, and there's a Boston Austrian Economics Group that's a little bit larger than Mike and I. It's like 10 people <laughs> that meets in a restaurant every week. And it's kind of too noisy for a podcast, but. Uh, we might be able to finagle a private room. So uh, we may start doing some Liberty Me episodes from the Boston area as well. Oh, I, I got something to talk about for four minutes till we get kicked off. Uh, <laughs> Uber in Portsmouth is kind of oh, a great yes. kind of public choice thing where, um, so what, what are like the incentives and what would, how would people be acting? There's some rent seeking going on there. Yeah. So I was at the protest. Uh, so pretty much the Uber, was banned in Portsmouth, New Hampshire by um, the cab cartel, pretty much. Uh, and so now uh, we've been protesting. And so just as expected, every uh, cab that goes by the protest flicks us off because we're of uh, Uber protesters. And so that kind of shows that, yes, there is overt hostility towards uh, Uber from the cab movement, but this is just public choice theory, right? Of course, they're hostile to their competitor. Course, Coke yeah. and Coke would be killing Pepsi if they could. They just can't get away with it. Yeah, you know that's why the drug gangs kill each other because there's they can't get away with it. <laughs> um, and so, you know. Why did the city council vote that way, though, is a question. Was there money being paid from the cab drivers to the city council? Possibly, although Portsmouth is a very uh, kind of tight town where the cab drivers, you know, might have 20 friends. So suppose a cab driver has 20 friends in town and there's 100 cab drivers with 20 friends each. That's definitely enough to win an election. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think the people who use Uber in Portsmouth are probably not uh, residents of Portsmouth. I bet most people who come into Portsmouth to party, you know, aren't necessarily living in right. Portsmouth. Maybe at least 80% of the people in Portsmouth partying on any Saturday or Friday night, they don't um, live in Portsmouth. So the crowds on the streets were all very pro Uber. It seemed like, how could this town vote against Uber? Everyone on the street loves Uber, right. but they're not the voters. And um, there might be, it. yeah, there might be corruption in the city council, but even if there's not, you could still explain the anti-Uber vote where right. the cab drivers all have 20 friends and that's enough to win an election. And the people actually using Uber don't vote because they're out of towners. So, uh, or there's much as money being handed to them, which is probably more likely. <laughs> uh, well, we'll have to look, we're doing more yeah. research on who funded their campaigns and stuff. Oh, really? uh, you know, I suspect 
you know, we've seen a lot of people kind of talking and handing uh, envelopes through pictures being taken. Uh, <laughs> We're really getting into the wow. investigative uh, media here. Doing undercover work. Yeah, over yeah. There. Wow. Well, our lead <laughs> activist is now on a damn wiretapping felony <laughs> charge because he was, it wasn't wiretapping. He was recording a bouncer <laughs> intimidating him. Yeah, the bouncer was intimidating him outside of uh, the bar where right. he was picking up an Uber driver, and he recorded this on his phone from his car. Right. But I guess New Hampshire's wiretapping laws are like uber strict, which ah. which kind of like I guess I'm torn at as a libertarian because we like privacy, but it's obvious the cops are just using this to kind of crack down on their yeah. opponents and the dissidents. Uh. Yeah, there might be some sleuthing going on. I guess yeah, get a telephoto lens and hide out at a city hall or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's tough because maybe there's no corruption and it's just progressivism, right? Where, oh, there's an unregulated corporation that's cheating. Yeah, Everyone should play by the same rules. You know, all these It's more the benevolence lines. portion of the yeah. uh, thing versus the, the uh, Baptist or the bootlegger, you know, which is some combination of the two. Um, well, I think <laughs> our episode is over, so we'll stop the broadcast. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.